Okay, uh, maybe let's start the second talk. So, Ivan, are you ready? Yes, I'm. Okay, so let's begin. So, uh, the second talk today will be by Professor Ismerdia from Austria. He will talk about uh, discrete spherical Laplacian. Please go ahead. So, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I, I've tried my best. Um, but so please uh, ask the questions. I think I, it, it will be difficult for me to see the chat. Well, maybe I will try that. But anyway, so if I miss some questions, then just pick up. Um, all right, so I will speak about discrete spherical Laplacian and the plan is as follows. First, I will remind about the smooth Laplacian, the classical one and uh, the combinatorial Laplacian. Then I move to geometry and uh, give it a view of the discrete Euclidean Laplacians. Uh, so where among them we will meet the cotangent Laplacian known, known to, uh, so to most of you, I think. And then in the last part, I will introduce a discrete spherical Laplacian. And hopefully I will also explain at the end why uh, do we need, why may we need to have a spherical Laplacian in its discrete uh, version. So the smooth Laplacian, um, well, for me, the Laplacian for, the, for a function of two variables, so from R2 to R, um, it's minus d squared f dx squared minus d squared f dy squared. So I apologize to Laplacian for putting the minus sign here, but um, I just want this operator to be a positive semi-definite. And the functions uh, with vanishing Laplacian are called harmonic, and they describe stationary heat distributions. Uh, the harmonicity is in fact equivalent to the mean value property. So that, uh, so which says that the value at every point is the average of the values on every circle centered at that point. And this mean value property uh, clearly implies the maximum principle. There can be no local maximum in the interior of the domain. So indeed, if you are the average of your neighbors, then you cannot be bigger than each of your neighbors. And the Laplacian is self-adjoint, uh, self-adjoint with respect to the L2 product on the space of functions. L2 product means we are integrating the product of the functions. So if you take the integral of Laplacian f times h, then this is the same as the integral of f times Laplacian h, because both of them are equal to the integral of the inner product of the gradients of f and h. And this formula um, applied to h equal f, shows that uh, the Laplacian is positive semi-definite. The L2 product of Laplacian f and f is equal to the um, integral of the norm of the gradient. All right, so now let us uh, try to remember these um, nice properties and try to um, mimic them in a discrete setting. So the first way to discretize the Laplacian is just to take a square grid so now, uh, instead of functions on the plane, I consider functions defined only on the nodes of a square grid. And I denote the value at the point with coordinates ij by f sub ij. So here are the values at f at ij and at the neighbors of that point. Then, um, well, the discrete analog of the second partial derivative in x uh, is, of course, this thing. So that's difference of two differences. And the second partial derivative in y, it's uh, like here. So now if I sum them up and put my minus sign before that, uh, then I get this expression for the value of the Laplacian at the point ij. So that's actually exactly four times the value at ij minus the values at all of the neighbors. <coughs> and this implies that, um, again, harmonicity so Laplacian f being zero at all the points is equivalent to the mean value property. So that um, the value at every point is the arithmetic mean of the values at the neighbor, neighbor, neighboring points. And again, of course, mean value property implies the maximum principle by the same argument. And one can show that uh, this uh, linear operator is self-adjoint and positive semi-definite because if you multiply that expression with uh, fij and sum up, and then do some um, the distribution of the products, which will be basically discrete analog of integration by parts, then you will get this expression. 
is just the sum of um, squares of differences between the values at neighboring points. So these are all horizontal edges and these are all vertical edges. So that's, uh, of course, the perfect uh, discretization. Um, that's everything that we can only desire. Uh, now let's try to generalize it further. So let us go beyond the square grid. And we can take, in fact, any graph, so any abstract graph with vertex set V and edge set E. Um, so the graph need not to be drawn anywhere. It's just an abstract uh, set of data. And again, a function. A function is now defined on the set of vertices. And we denote the value, well, vertices are denoted by i, j, and so on. And the value at the vertex i is denoted by f sub i. And uh, let us define the Laplacian as follows. The value of Laplacian f at the point i, the vertex i, is the sum of the differences of i minus uh, its neighbors. So that's uh, similar to what we had for the square grid. So if you take this definition, if you adopt this definition, then again, a uh, harmonic function is exactly that where the value at every point is the average of its neighbors. And again, this implies the maximum principle. And again, by uh, regrouping the uh, terms in this um, product, one gets that Laplacian f times f, so which means just the sum of Laplacian f at i times f at i, sum over i, this is equal to the sum of the squares of differences. So that's positive semi-different. Um, so before going further, I just mentioned a couple of nice properties of the uh, of this combinatorial Laplacian, so graph Laplacian. Uh, the spectrum of, that, uh, of this operator, uh, in fact, reflects uh, interesting properties of the graph. For example, if you take all the um, all the non-zero eigenvalues, so one eigenvalue is zero, that's for so constant functions. But if you uh, multiply all the non-zero uh, eigenvalues and divide by the number of vertices, then you get the number of spanning trees in the graph. And of course, when one sees such an such an amazing formula, one wants to check it on some example. So here is the simplest, interesting example, I guess. Uh, this graph has eight spanning trees, all of them are listed here. Let us now check that the formula holds. Uh, we are writing down the Laplacian matrix. Um, so that's exactly the matrix of that operator that I have written there. So there's minus one for every edge. Uh, so this zero corresponds to no edge between the two vertices there. Well, um, now to compute the product of the non-zero eigenvalues. Of course, you can compute the um, characteristic polynomial, but there is a shorter way in fact, uh, it can be shown that the product of non-zero eigenvalues is equal to the determinant of any principal three by three um, minor. So let us choose the simplest one uh, formed by the first three rows and first three columns um, and compute the determinant. So that will be two times three times two, minus two times minus one minus one minus two times minus one minus one. So that's 12 minus two minus two, this is eight. Oh, and this is the same eight as there. And another property of the um, spectrum of the Laplacian is that the first eigenvalue, so the smallest on zero eigenvalue uh, is related to the expansion properties of the graph. And the uh, good expansion means that it's uh, hard, it's difficult to cut the graph into two almost equal parts. So one has to cut um, a lot of edges so a big portion of the edges. And this um, good expansion uh, is equivalent to lambda one being large. So there, is, there are two side estimates between the two parameters. All right, so that's the um, discrete, uh, no, that's the combinatorial part of the story because I want to distinguish between combinatorial, so which is combinatorial and discrete, which is discrete geometric. Um, now let us bring the geometry back and it will come um, now in form of a triangulation. Uh, so we have a set of points in the plane, for example, um, and um, we are triangulating the plane using those points as vertices of the triangulation. Now we can write, um, we can define the discrete Laplacian in a similar way, but putting some weights uh, for all the edges of the triangulation. Now, um, it is good to have these edges positive because, um, again, harmonic function is exactly that where this equality holds. And if the weights are positive, then this is 
a weighted average, which means uh, that one has the maximum principle. Right, so it's now not the exact arithmetic mean, but the weighted average. And uh, so the operator is always self-adjoint. And again, if you have positive weights, uh, then the operator is positive semi-definite. Because in the sum, you will get some wij, fi minus fj squared, if you put h equal f. Good, but the question is how to choose uh, these weights. Um, how does the geometry determine the weights wij? And of course, so there is uh, the well-known and very nice formula, uh, the cotangent Laplacian. Um, for every hij, we are looking at the two opposite vertices, k and l. So on either side of the edge and uh, denote by alpha ij k, alpha ij l, the angles of those vertices. And now here, um, so the weight is just the sum of the cotangents uh, of these angles. So when is the weight positive or at least non-negative? Uh, since the sum of cotangents can be written as this quotient and sine of alpha plus beta is, well, positive if alpha plus beta is smaller than pi, uh, we get that uh, the weights are positive if and only if the triangulation is Delaunay. So if and only if the sum of opposite angles is less or equal pi. Uh, this is, in fact, a very nice result because, um, because the Delaunay tessellation uh, is uniquely determined by the points. Well, tessellation means we will not always be getting triangles. So if you have a, if this quadrilateral would be inscribed, then there, there would be no edge between ij. And you can get a Delaunay triangulation by subdividing the tessellation um, arbitrarily. Actually, it does not change the Laplacian because the weights of the fictive edges, the edges, uh, the weights of the added edges will all be zero. So actually, the uh, this, in, this canonical Laplacian is associated with the Delaunay tessellation, not the Delaunay triangulation. And another uh, nice fact is that if you have an abstract polyhedral surface, so that's what uh, Kieran Klein explained, um, if you glue uh, together triangles or polygons and forget where you did glue them, um, then you still can see the singular points, the cone points, and uh, this surface can be, uh, has a unique Delaunay tessellation as well. And so you can define a canonical intrinsic discrete proportion. Good. Um, so that's already um, enough reasons to take this definition. But uh, one feels that uh, it should be good. It would be good to uh, give some more uh, explanation why these weights are uh, the correct ones. Uh, so let us try to do it by uh, coming back to the analysis to the um, classical proportion. Um, so if you have a function which is defined on the vertices of a triangle, then you can extend it in a unique way to a piecewise linear function on the triangle. And uh, if you have a function on the vertices of a triangulation, then you can extend it uh, to, uh, to all of the triangulation. Right? So for in every triangle, just use the values at the vertices. For this piecewise linear function, the Laplacian does not make much sense because it, it, it vanishes inside the triangles and is not defined on the edges of the triangles. But the gradient does make a lot of sense because the gradient is something uh, non-zero, something interesting inside the triangles. And it's not too bad that it is not defined on the edges because we can integrate. Um, yes, so because if we take this formula that we have um, written down in the smooth case, so that was a theorem. And uh, we will now um, make this theorem to a definition. So we define the discrete Laplacian f in a weak sense. So that is, um, we define the inner product of the Laplacian f with any function h as the integral of the product of the gradients of the piecewise linear extensions. And it turns out that if you compute this integral, then the result will be a quadratic, well, will be a symmetric bilinear form in f and h, so in f i's and h i's. And this uh, form can be written in this in this uh, so in this form, uh, and the weights W I J are exactly the cotangent weights. So this is the sum of the sums of cotangents. So that's of course now uh, everybody believes that the cotangent uh, cotangent weights are the right ones. Um, so note that I don't want to um, somehow to to choose 
I don't want to say what kind of scalar product I, what kind of inner product I'm taking here. One might take uh, the standard um, product like that, and then one gets the formula for the Laplacian as we had uh, before. But uh, you will see later that I'm actually, I don't like this inner product. Um, so this definition, somehow this uh, introduction of the cotangent Laplacian is due to Duffin and uh, also independently discovered later by Intel Pontier. Uh, so in their work on discrete minimal surfaces. All right, so what's next? Um, uh, there is another um, nice interpretation of the uh, cotangent weights, namely, um, if together with your triangulation, you have a dual one, and the dual triangulation means, um, oh, well, not a triangulation. So if you have a tessellation, say the one tessellation, and the dual tessellation, which means that um, faces of the dual correspond to vertices of the primal and vice versa, and the edges um, are the corresponding edges are orthogonal. Uh, this, for example, you can find by taking the one tessellation and it's um, the corresponding quadroid diagram. Or you can take weighted DNA and the power diagram. So this is when you imagine that at, um, if the vertex sits at circle and instead of um, somehow this, um, what are they called? So the mid perpendiculars, uh, you take the radical axis of the of the circles. So in any way, um, let's stay with DNA and Um Then for every for every edge ij, you have this, this dual edge which I wanted to denote lij star. And um, if you take the ratio of the length dual edge divided by the primal edge, then you get exactly the sum of the cotangents again. And this is, in fact, easy to see from that picture because the points inside the triangles are the uh, circumcenters. So this angle, the opposite angle of the triangle is equal to half of the central angle. And you just see the cotangents uh, popping out there. So that's the discrete exterior calculus approach, and it uh, can be generalized to higher dimensions because, of course, you can take the linear tessellation of a set point of a point set in the space, and you can take the Voronoi diagram, and then instead of um, orthogonal edges, you will get this dual face, and you can take the area of that face divided by the length, and you get again positive weights. Again, it's very nice to have positive weights. All right. Good, uh, so let's see what next. But on the other hand, we can generalize our um, piecewise linear extension approach to the, to the higher dimensions. So the call that we take our functions f and h defined on the vertices of a triangulation, we extend them to um, piecewise linear functions f tilde and h tilde, and then integrate this product. One can do it as well in dimension three and higher. Uh, the formula that you get is here. Um, this expression in the brackets is the weight at the edge ij, and it is the sum of all simplices sigma containing the edge ij. And in this sum, you, you take um, the volume of the edge, the volume of the face uh, opposite to ij in sigma, and uh, multiply it with the cotangent of the angle at this uh, opposite face. So here's a picture in dimension three. This is our H i g. Um, all sigmas which contain this i g, I -G are tetrahedral around this edge. And for each simplex sigma, I'm taking the edge which is opposite to i g, take its length. Its length will be this capital A, and take the uh, cotangent of the hedral angle. Note that if you go back to dimension two, then uh, this is exactly what we had, because in dimension two there are only two faces containing the edge, and the opposite faces are just the opposite vertices, and you have, and the volume of a vertex is one. So that's um, a direct generalization of the, of the previous formula. All right, good. It would be nice if it would coincide with the, um, with the previous formula, which is um, so known from the discrete exterior calculus, but it does not. Um, to see that this formula is different from the previous one, one can take um, a by pyramid, well, I can take a sphere. Um, in the equator of the sphere, um, inscribe a um, regular n-gon. Actually, it doesn't need to be regular, just any n-gon inscribed in the equator. 
and um, I and G are the south and the north pole. Uh, then this is uh, somehow the Delonet oscillation will just ignore the edge. Uh, so the Delonet cell will be this bipyramid as a whole. But that means that if we add this edge, then the um, weight in the discrete exterior calculus formula will be equal to zero, right? Because, um, yes, because the Voronoi cells touch each other just at one point. Um, so the discrete exterior calculus weight will be equal to zero, but what happens with, the, uh, with these dihedral angles? Um, the dihedral angle at every edge will be, will be obtuse. So this is not hard to see. Uh, this will be obtuse, and that means that all these cotangents are negative and the weight is negative, which is um, somehow bad news. All right, so um, this shows that uh, these two general generalizations of the uh, cotangent proportion are different. And um, so let us think about, um, do we really need positive weights? It would be, of, of course, good to have them, but uh, we have seen that even for Delonet triangulation, um, so this tilde weights, the Dodzik-Whitney weights uh, may be negative. And what can be better than a Delonet triangulation? But uh, still, even, uh, Although the weights are maybe negative, uh, this uh, Laplacian that we defined with the tilde, with discrete, um, well, with piecewise linear extension, so this uh, Laplacian is still uh, positive semi definite. Because remember, we have this formula, so the integral of the uh, squared norm of the gradient, that's always non negative. Uh, however, we lose the maximum principle if we allow the weights to be negative. So um, either we just say goodbye to the maximum principle or we try to find a good triangulation. So of course, if, um, well, not of course, but maybe one can find um, in any polyhedral manifold uh, a sufficiently nice triangulation. That's basically, that's actually an open question. I don't know uh, if it's possible to find for any um, somehow polyhedral object at triangulation where all these weights would, would be would be non-negative. Um, all right. Um, then also actually there is another problem with delineate oscillations. Uh, if one goes to dimensions higher than two, um, it's all right if you have just point sets in Rn, then the delineate oscillation uh, exists and is unique. But if you glue together now not triangles and polygons but some polyhedra. So then you get uh, singularities along the edges, and it can happen, if, in fact, that you have no singular points at all. Uh, for example, that is a beautiful example of gluing together several bricks and getting um, getting a piecewise Euclidean metric on the sphere where the singular locus are the Borromean rings. There are no vertices, and you don't know how to triangulate that. You have to choose you have to choose some additional vertices. So there is no intrinsic um, telnet angulation in that case. Well, I can, of course, also say that if you take a torus, a flat torus in the dimension two, then uh, it also does not have a canonical uh, triangulation. You have to choose some point. All right. Um, so these are some thoughts about high dimensions. And um, now I want to put uh, the previous things in a, in, in a even more general context. Uh, so I will briefly speak about the discrete Hodge theory, which is quite old. Uh, so you see it was discovered by Benno Ekman in 45. Um, so let us take a triangulation T, which can be actually an abstract simplicial complex of any dimension. Uh, we consider the cochain space of that triangulation. Um, cochain space of dimension K is just a set of uh, all linear combinations of uh, synthesis of dimension K. And uh, we define the co-boundary operator on this, uh, on the co-chains and the co-boundary sends every simplex to the sum of the simplices for which, um, well, which contains, which contains, the, which contain that simplex. But so it's co-boundary, you don't take the boundary of the simplex, but you take everything which contains uh, it in the boundary. Um, and so the co-boundary of a vertex is the sum of all edges incident to that vertex. And um, so these are, these are the linear maps between vector spaces. Now assume that you have 
chosen in some way an inner product on each of these vector spaces. If you, if you have chosen a, an inner product, then you can define uh, the adjoint linear operators, so which go in the opposite direction. So the definition is just like that. So that's the usual adjoint. And um, having these D's and deltas, uh, you define the uh, Laplacian uh, by that formula. So the Laplacian goes then um, from CK to CK, for example, from C1 to C1, you just, uh, you take the sum of D1 and after that delta two and delta one and after that D0. And that's an operator on the um, on k dimensional core chains. Um, so Ben Eichmann just well stated uh, in the year 1945, the classic, so the Hodge theory was very young. So this discrete Hodge theory was really uh, something um, very new and non trivial. And um, so everything, everything here, so the important thing here is the choice of the inner products QK on the cochain spaces. You can uh, go the simple way and choose the, um, uh, the standard inner product. So just the Cartesian Euclidean inner product. Um, and um, uh, Foreman in 2003 uh, so has studied this, um, so this combinatorial Hodge theory and uh, so derived the combinatorial curvature theory from that. So you know that sometimes the curvature, um, ba curvature bounds imply some topological um, properties of the manifold. So he has um, uh, studied a combinatorial analog of, of those theorems using, um, so using this uh, product. So in the special case of uh, C0, so um, the zero co-chains are just functions and this uh, direct choice of the inner product gives just the, the combinatorial, uh, the graph Laplacian. So this formal theory is the generalization of the graph Laplacian. And Dotsuk in 1976, um, so has made the following choice. So his construction was a bit different, but this is actually what uh, it is very close to. Um, for every simplex sigma in our simplicial complex, let us define the, so, well, Whitney form defined by Whitney, um, which is written here. So these mu i's are the barycentric coordinates. Um, you know the barycentric coordinates in a simplex, but if you have a um, simplicial complex, then you can take uh, but the centric coordinates in every simplex, inside every simplex, and then the coordinate corresponding to the vertex i, it is defined over all simplices containing the vertex i, right? So mu i is a function which is defined uh, in the star of the vertex i. Uh, therefore, this expression makes sense. And this is now a differential k form. Um, of course, here I should have started with mu zero because um, because in a k-dimensional simplex I have uh, k plus one k plus one by the centric coordinates, and then this becomes really k form. And then we define the inner product between two cochains as the L two product of the corresponding Whitney forms. Um, you can recognize here the um, so our if uh, nabla f and nabla h approach, uh, it's exactly that in the case of k equals zero. So this um, gives a discrete, somehow also, um, not a combinatorial, but really discrete Hodge theory on simplicial complexes, on Euclidean simplicial complexes. All right, um, so let me now uh, move to the spherical discrete proportion. So I'm going to define something which, um, again is similar to the, to the smooth case. So what uh, exactly do we want? What exactly do we want? So our discrete um, object will be a triangulation of the sphere or triangulation of some part of it. So you just take a um, finite set of points in the sphere and um, take the convex hull, spherical convex hull. So it's spherical polygon, or you can um, glue together spherical triangles or spherical simplices of any dimension and get a spherical polyhedral manifold. And we want to define a self-adjoint operator again um, on the space of um, functions uh, defined on the um, defined defined on the vertices of our triangulation. 
So exactly as before, but the properties, properties of this operator should be similar to the properties of the spherical Laplacian. For example, the Laplacian on the sphere has the following spectrum. Again, there is a zero eigenvalue, which corresponds to constant functions. And the next, so the smallest uh, positive eigenvalue is equal to n, the dimension of the sphere. The multiplicity of this eigenvalue is equal to n plus one. And uh, the eigenfunctions, uh, the eigenfunctions to this eigenvalue are exactly the linear functions on the sphere. What is a linear function of the sphere? It's a distinction of a linear function on R n plus one. And we have exactly so the dimension of this linear functions is n plus one. So let us try to um, cook up something in this case which has these properties, and it is possible. So we'll get to it. Um, to do that, we will need to use some tools from the convex geometry, so namely the Steiner formula. Um, and again, we will look at the smooth and the polyhedral case at the same time because we want um, to make a construction in the polyhedral case inspired by uh, the smooth situation. So um, let M be a body in R3. I want now to concentrate so let me go back. I want to concentrate on the case n equal two. So let us imagine the two-dimensional sphere points on the two-dimensional sphere, spherical polygons, not polyhedral. And for that, I need to consider three-dimensional bodies. So these pictures are two-dimensional, but please imagine an ellipsoid or something like that. And here, imagine any uh, convex polyhedral. I consider the set of all points at distance at most t from the, this smooth body or from this um, convex polyhedron. And I compute the volume of that uh, T neighborhood. Um, uh, not very difficult computation in the smooth case shows that the volume is a polynomial where the linear term is the, uh, the coefficient here is the area of the boundary and um, the coefficient at T squared is the integral of the mean curvature and at the T cube you get all the integral of the Gaussian curvature divided by three. So that means here you just get four pi divided by three. In the polyhedral case, you can cut up this um, neighborhood into pieces. In dimension two, it's already very nice. You take the rectangles uh, which are sitting on the edges and it gives you t times the, well, the perimeter in dimension two or the area in dimension three. Then you get um, in dimension three cylindrical wedges along the edges. And each of these cylindrical wedges uh, has the following volume. It's the length of the edge times the angle, yes, angle divided by two because we are computing the area of a circle here. And finally, there are pieces which are sitting at the vertices. Uh, so these are the, well, in fact, so here we are computing the volume of the points for which the nearest, nearest point map sent them to the vertices. So here uh, is the image of the nearest point map of the edges, and here's the image of the nearest point map of the faces. And uh, by the way, in this last term, you will also get four pi divided by three, because if you take these um, pieces of the unit ball, well, of the ball of radius t, which are sitting at the vertices, then you, go, you can put all of them together to get a ball. So this coefficient is equal to four pi over three as well. That's sort of um, discrete Gauss Bonnet in a simple situation. All right, so what do we get from uh, looking at these two formulas? We get that um, these two coefficients somehow play a very similar role. The integral of the mean curvature and the sum of the edges times the um, exterior angles, um, they play the same role in, in these two formulas. In fact, if we now move from the smooth and polyhedral situation to the most general convex bodies, and the convex body need not be smooth or polyhedral, you can take the uh, convex hull of some fractal on the sphere, and the convex hull of a fractal curve on the sphere will be something convex, but very so bent like this, um, um, actually like the surfaces from the from Christopher Bishop's talk. Uh, this will still be a convex body, but it's neither uh, applies in neither of these classes. Turns out that uh, so the volume of this T neighborhood, um, well, it's actually easy to see that the volume of the T neighborhood depends continuously on the on the convex body. If you measure the distance between two convex bodies with the house of distance, and um, 
So the, for any convex body with irregular boundary, you will again have this uh, polynomial, with certain coefficients, and these coefficients, they converge um, if the sequence of bodies converges to something. In particular, this means that uh, these two expressions, so the integral of the mean curvature and the sum of the length times the length, they also converge to each other. So if you approximate uh, a smooth body by polyhedra, or if you approximate a um, uh, polyhedron by smooth bodies. All right. Um, for an other convex body, uh, we know that the coefficient w1 will be one of the three, the area of the boundary. Well, actually, that's a definition of the Minkowski uh, content of the boundary. And um, the last coefficient will be 4 pi divided by 3 because it's, it was always constant. But the second coefficient, it's, well, um, there are no means to, well, there are some means to compute it, but not uh, obvious ones. And uh, a nice formula from the integral geometry says that um, each of these coefficients um, is proportional to the average projection volume of the body K to uh, linear subspaces. So um, these Ws are called by the uh, beautiful German word Quedmas integrals, so which means integral of a cross measure. And uh, this integral geometric principle um, is illustrated in the last two lines. So the surface area, the W1, is twice the average projection area of the body. That's the Cauchy uh, theorem. And the total mean curvature, if you take a smooth body, then the integral of the mean curvature is to pi times the average width, where the width is a projection to a line, length of projection of a line, and average width is the integral of those projection lengths. The last formula, and actually the Cauchy formula, they are really amazing because um, say the mean curvature is something local. You can compute the mean curvature um, just by taking a small piece of the surface. But the width uh, is a global thing, and here the integrals of these two um, quantities coincide. All right, so again, why do we need all that? Um, because the Laplacian appears already on this slide. Uh, the quad mass integrals, so W1, W2, and W3, they will be the main, um, so the main objects on the next couple of slides. So let us maybe try to remember uh, W1 was the area and W3 was a constant just for, for pi over 3. And W2 is the most um, mysterious one. So it turns out that um, the support function is a very useful thing. If you have a convex body, um, then you define the support function as a function on uh, the sphere. Again, this picture is in one dimension less than it should be. Um, u is a unit vector in the sphere. It just shows um, um, direction in the space. And uh, h of u is the distance from the origin to the tangent plane or support plane of the convex body with the outward normal u. For example, if the body is a ball centered at the origin, then the support function is constant equal to the radius. Note that the support function can also be negative if uh, the origin lies outside of the convex body. And by the way, moving the origin or moving the body uh, changes the support function by a linear function. And you know that linear functions um, so will play some important role uh, very soon. All right, so a support function determines the uh, convex body uniquely. And if uh, the boundary is smooth, then the support function is also smooth. And one can compute, in fact, the total mean curvature, W2, and the area, W1, uh, as follows. In this W2, in fact, you can see the um, average bits. Because if I take h of u plus h of minus u, then I will um, measure the widths in the direction of u. All right. And uh, there was also W3, which is just a constant. And there is this uh, inequality, which is a special case of the Minkowski inequality. Uh, and it says that W2 squared is bigger or equal than W1 times W3. And I claim that this inequality is um, equivalent to the fact that the uh, spherical Laplacian has the smallest uh, positive eigenvalue equal to 2. So let me explain why uh, these two facts are very closely related. Um, maybe some outlook for the um, 
So why again, I'm, I need that. Later we will go to the discrete situation and again, we will use um, a theorem as a definition. And then um, our theorem about the spectrum of the discrete spherical Laplacian will follow from that inequality, from the first inequality, because the first inequality can be proved independently of the, I mean, of the uh, spectrum of the spherical Laplacian. All right, so let me explain why these theorems tell the same. Um, so W3 was the volume of the unit ball, which is one third of the area of the unit sphere. So we're dealing now with functions on the sphere. Therefore, I'm replacing the ball by the sphere whenever I can. Um, so we have our support function and the second Cadmus integral is one third the integral of H, which is the L2, uh, L2 product of H with a constant function one. And that can be written as the average value of H. H bar is the average value of H times the area divided by three. So let me take any function f on the sphere. Oh, no, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I was taking any function h. Uh, so let me um, subtract from h its average and I get a function f with zero average. Function f has zero average, it means that f is orthogonal to uh, the constant functions. And uh, since we know everything about the spectrum of the Laplacian on the sphere, being orthogonal to the um, zero eigenspace implies that um, Laplacian f times f is bigger or equal than twice the squared norm of f, right? So this follows from the, so this is equivalent, basically this inequality is equivalent to lambda one equal to two. All right, and now I take my w1, uh, which was, um, which is equal to that. I replace h by f plus h bar. h bar is a constant function and Laplacian of h bar is zero. So if I do some computations, then I get this formula. And now I have a square plus f times to f minus Laplacian f, which is, um, which is also, which is what, so uh, yes, yeah, so the inequality should be in the opposite direction, that should be bigger or equal. <clears throat> Yeah, so this uh, here will have bigger equal uh, than that because f times to f minus Laplacian f is um, at least zero. Oh no, no, that's a correct inequality because this is therefore equal to zero. So we get um, that inequality. It doesn't matter that we have something positive here. We just have that, um, but this is exactly w two squared divided by w three. So. Uh, and this is the mean cost inequality that we, we are setting here. All right, so now we want, so the plan was as I described here. <clears throat> now we take, um, so we will use that inequality, but um, well, well, all right. So um, this formula for W1, which is the area of the boundary involves uh, the Laplacian of the support function. We now want to look um, at convex polyhedra and compute the area of a convex polyhedron. So the area of the boundary of convex polyhedron. And from the formula of the area, we will expect something which, will, which we will uh, declare to be the Laplacian. Right, so we are taking this formula and um, promoting this to, to a definition. So for this, we need to make some um, preparations. Um, again, so that's a big slide, but let us see. So we have um, n points, u1, so on un on the sphere, and this will be the vertices of my triangulation. I want to define a discrete spherical Laplacian uh, for functions uh, defined on this set of points. Good, so I need a, a condition that, um, that in every open hemisphere, there is at least one of these points, this is equivalent to saying that if I um, take the intersection of the uh, of the half spaces with the normals ui, then this intersection will always be um, bounded. This intersection is in fact a, a convex polyhedron, which has um, the vectors ui as the unit normals. 
So I'm looking at the space of convex polyhedra with the same directions of, of their face normals. Uh, so if I choose um, this H, so H is uh, just a collection of numbers. That's, these are support numbers. If I choose them at random, then um, my polyhedron will be simple. That is, we'll have three edges at every vertex. But the combinatorics of uh, P of H um, can depend on H. Uh, if I, for example, if I um, take an octahedron and uh, move its faces parallelly, then I can get many different combinatorics. Good. Let us choose all these support numbers equal to one, which means, so in this inequalities, H i is always equal to one. Uh, my half spaces are tangent to the unit sphere. So the intersection is a uh, is the convex polyhedron circumscribed about the sphere and touching it at exactly those points you want so on your end. Um, by the way, this uh, corresponds to the Delanet oscillation, or so the combinatorics of the polyhedron will be the Polonoid oscillation and the adjacency graph will be the Delanet oscillation. Uh, one can also investigate all possible combinatorics. Um, so when you change on those HIs, this is in fact related to the um, secondary polytope and so-called weighted Delaunay or uh, regular or coherent triangulations. All of these are the same, but different names in different um, areas of mathematics. Um, and although the secondary polytope was introduced by Gilfant Kaplan and Zelewinski, in fact, in an earlier work by Peter McMullen, it was already uh, implicitly present. But that's an aside remark. So let us now look at this um, polyhedron. Um, circumscribed about the sphere and touching the sphere at the given set of points. Um, we will want to compute the area of this polyhedron, and not only of this polyhedron, but of any polyhedron um, with the same combinatorics, but different um, distances. Right? So uh, this picture shows two points, ui and tj, and uh, the planes uh, tangent to the sphere at those points. So this is a part of that circumscribed uh, polyhedron, so to say discrete sphere. Now, if I um, move these faces, so if I change the distances from one to any fi, that will be my function fi of which I will be computing the uh, Laplacian. And then I define the Laplacian, but in a weak sense and with a diagonal term in the following way. So area of F is the area of the convex polyhedron uh, defined by those distances Fi's uh, of the faces from the origin. This is a quadratic form in Fi's, so uh, and it can be written down explicitly. So what are lambda ij's here? Um, so when you see these vertices u r u j, then you um so you want to triangulate the sphere. Um, with vertices at your eyes. And um, again, as I said, the triangulation uh, that comes from the polyhedron will be the Delaunay triangulation. And lambda ij is just the distance between these edges of these vertices. But the distance on the sphere is the angle. So this lambda ij is the angle here or the distance um, on the picture on the right hand side. And lij star turns out to be, well, that's uh, the length of this edge in the uh, circumscribed polyhedron. So this formula is in fact very similar to the one uh, from the discrete exterior calculus. We are dividing uh, the dual edge length by something which is, well, if lambda is small, then the tangent of lambda is equal, almost equal to lambda. So we are dividing um, Lij star by Lij. Uh, so here, we, um, in the Euclidean case, we had uh, the square of the difference Fi minus Fj. So here we have the coefficient, which is um, different, which is bigger than two. So that's the um, difference between the Euclidean and the spherical Laplacian. All right, so that's an implicit formula and, uh, well, explicit, but also implicit in the sense that um, I don't want to choose what um, inner product um, is, um, so is here. And now, as I promised, this um, Laplacian has um, very nice properties. So first of all, it, um, it converges to the spherical Laplacian. If you take a sequence of point sets uh, which fills the sphere, 
so that um, for every point in the sphere, there will be a point at the distance epsilon um, in one of those sets. Uh, and this fact follows from the um, uh, from the continuity of the Kratmas integrals and in particular of the area with respect to the house of distance. And the spectral property of the um, of this discrete spherical apportion um, is exactly as in the smooth case. Uh, the next, um, so the smallest positive eigenvalue is equal to two. So what do we mean by the smallest negative eigenvalue um, if we define the Laplacian in that way? We mean that um, this quadratic form has one negative eigenvalue and uh, it has a um, null space of dimension three. And all the other eigenvalues are positive. So if one can speak about the eigenvalues for quadratic forms. So we claim that uh, that quadratic form defined on the previous page has exactly that signature. Uh, well, now I have plus here and minus is there. So that's really not, um, so that's the uh, Laplacian with the plus signs. And this fact follows from, uh, from the Minkowski inequality exactly in the same way, or almost in the same way as I have shown on the uh, page with a long proof. So that's exactly what we wanted to get. Also a small um, remark. So when you see the signature where you have one plus and many minuses, so the Lorentzian signature, then you want to find something hyperbolic geometric there. So um, people try to do that. So in particular, um, so in our joint work with Francois Fidast, we have uh, considered exactly the case of dimension three um, and also high dimensions. And, um, and um, you get the signature also if you just look at the areas of polygons um, with so where the edges have uh, a given direction. So if you take a polygon and displace its edges parallelly, then you get a space of polygons and the quadratic form on that space of polygons. So that's an article of Pavard Schiss, um, so who also prove this signature, but independent of the um, of the context geometry. And the work of Pavard Schiss was inspired by uh, by an article of Thurston, which appeared six years later. Um, Thurston studied the space of shapes of convex polyhedra, so it also considered areas, but areas on the um, of Convex polyhedra with given um, common angles, and there was some complex, um, I mean, complex hyperbolic things there, not only real. Um, and since I still have eight minutes or maybe three minutes, I will just briefly mention um, another uh, reasons why this Laplacian is a good one. So here are four theorems which actually come in pairs. The first two are smooth; the last two are discrete, and the uh, Number three is no. Sorry. So the, the second is an analog of the first one. Uh, so if you take a paraboloid and consider an infinitesimal isometric deformation of it, so which is a vector field uh, such that if you move the paraboloid along that field, then the lengths change only in the second order, then the vertical component of this deformation will be a harmonic function. And um, also the converse is true. If you take any harmonic function, then you can find an infinitesimal isometric deformation with that vertical component. Now the cotangent Laplacian <coughs> in the plane has exactly the same property. Uh, if you consider convex polyhedra inscribed into the paraboloid, then the vertical components of their infinitesimal isometric deformations are discrete um, cotangent harmonic functions. Now the spherical Laplacian repeats um, so the same story. Um, if you take any subset of the sphere and consider an infinitesimal isometric deformation, then the radial component is an eigenfunction to the eigenvalue two, so the smallest positive eigenvalue. And our discrete spherical Laplacian that I just defined has the same property with respect to convex inscribed polyhedra. Also, where the uh, discrete spherical Laplacian should be of great use is uh, the study of the foundational properties of the discrete Hilbert Einstein functional. Um, so this is um, a functional that appears if you consider uh, gluings of uh, three-dimensional simplices. Well, it also makes sense in higher dimensions, but it's um, very interesting in dimension three. So if you glue together um, delta Hitler, then you will get um, um, cone angles around the edges. 
So this angle will be not necessarily equal to two pi. You can write down uh, the sum of lengths times the angles. We have seen something similar in the Steiner formula. There it was uh, an analog of total mean curvature. Here it's an analog of total scalar curvature. And total scalar curvature is another name for this for, for the Hilbert Einstein. And um, this functional, if I change the um, length of the edges, so if I use them as variables, then the partial derivative is equal to 2 pi minus theta e. And that means that critical points of this functional correspond to metrics without singularities, which is, of course, um, we just cry for using it to prove geometrization uh, of manifolds. One can write down the um, functionals for hyperbolic and spherical metrics. So when they are gluing hyperbolic or spherical tetrahedra together, so there is a volume term, which is also very natural because if this is the integral of scalar curvature, um, the curvature of um, that is a curvature inside the tetrahedra if they are hyperbolic or spherical. And uh, this function was used in some uh, um, in some situations. So for finding metrics on um, for finding hyperbolic metrics on manifolds with prescribed polyhedral boundary, but um, it's difficult to use it in other situations because the function is neither convex nor concave. And this repeats again the smooth story because the Riemannian Hilbert Einstein function also is also neither convex nor concave. It somehow tends to be convex on conformal deformations of the Riemannian metric and concave on all the others, or, well, on the orthogonal complement. And uh, this fact is proved by uh, actually, so when one proves that fact, then one comes to the Laplacian of the conformal factor or Laplacian of a certain tensor field. So um, if one wants to prove a discrete analog of this um, uh, property of the Hilbert Einstein, then what one would need a discrete spherical Laplacian. So another um, theorem where maybe the discrete Laplacian can be of help is uh, Chigurh's generalization of the um, what was the name of that theorem? So that's Bochner and um, Myers or Galois Myers. Um, if you have Euclidean superficial complex, actually of any dimension, um, where all curvatures are bigger than zero, then this complex is a real homology sphere. In dimension two, it is easy to prove because you just look at the Euler characteristic and see that it must be positive. And in higher dimensions, the proof by Chigurh is very complicated. Actually, here, um, generalizes this a lot. He goes from Euclidean spatial complex to the many manifold with um, edges, to so singular edges. And of course, one would like to prove it in a finite dimension, so using some finite dimensional um, things, so like um, discrete Laplacian. And another uh, theorem, which I would like very much to discretize, is the Lichnevovich theorem. If the Ricci curvature of the many manifold is well, not only positive, but also separated from the from zero by some constant, say n minus one, then the first uh, eigenvalue of the um, um, of the of the Laplace Lapl spectrum of that Riemannian manifold is at least equal to n. A discrete analog of that uh, should be stated for um, spherical polyhedral complexes, um, and so it will be interesting to to prove something like that. I see. Thank you. So I'm uh, finished exactly here. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Yvan. It was, was a nice talk. Uh, let's uh, thank the speaker first. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, Dave, yes, go ahead. Hi, Ivan. Thanks for the great talk. Is very interesting. Yeah. I uh, I was I'm curious. Um, so it seems like the spherical um, complex it, it it's related to these um, these polyhedra that are circumscribed around the sphere. And so I was wondering, sort of, either is there a way to think about them if they're for, for polyhedra that are not if those H's are not one. That's sort of one piece, or maybe I'm thinking about things wrong. Maybe, maybe you should. Your your idea is that we should be thinking about everything in terms of the spherical. So I, I'm just sort of curious about your your thoughts on 
on, on, on how to how to think about this. Yeah, so maybe I would be answering that question, but uh, so about the um, polyhedral which are not not circumscribed, uh, you can define something like a weighted Delaunay triangulation again. Uh, so if instead of all h i is equal to one, you choose any others, then and take the convex well and take the intersection of those half spaces. So like we defined here. So if instead all h i equal to one, you put something else here, um, then you you get a different uh, polyhedron with different combinatorics, possibly. And um, and I think one can define the um, weighted Laplacian in that case also. Um, and this weighted Laplacian will again have the same spectral properties. I'm quite confident. Um, so that's that's a possible generalization of the construction and um, it, can, it can happen that it's uh, it is also useful. I don't know if that's what you meant. Yeah, no, that's uh, I see. So, so the so it's exactly also like in the in the plane. In the plane, you can uh, take not the Delaunay triangulation, but um, uh, weighted Delaunay. Uh, so around the circles, and there. But I don't know if. I mean, uh, I know that. So, so you you studied the different proportions, and uh, they. I guess they're defined in a similar way. Also, ah, you have these uh, things also with the circles and the vertical axis. So then, one uh, the same thing can be also done for the sphere. I see. Yeah, so there are there is a whole family of uh, discrete Laplacians in the plane, and uh, the same goes for the sphere as well. That's also why I call it s spherical Laplacian. And also, I don't know what is the no. Of course, it can be generalized to higher dimensions as well. So not only to the total sphere. Okay, any other questions? Oh, well, I have one. So, so your definition of spherical, discrete spherical Laplacian works in any dimension, right? So, you, you, so on the screen, you wrote down the formula for 2D. Are you able to get an explicit formula in 3D? Uh, I did not try, I think. On the other hand, it's, of course, one should try to do that because um, we have an explicit formula for the Euclidean case, right? Also with cotangents, right? And uh, so there should be an explicit formula um, um, in all dimensions, but I I don't have it. Okay, yeah, I think for CD should be really interesting, especially related to the geometrizations in three Ds and things like that. On the other hand, the two-dimensional spherical Laplacian uh, is already related to dimension three. Because you can uh, right. you can view the uh, link of a vertex as a spherical metric, um, but already spherical metric with singularities, right? So if you take a manifold glued um, out of tetrahedra and take um, points at distance one from a given vertex, then you get a sphere with singular metric. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Do we have other questions? Oh, if not, yes. yes. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Ismati, for the great talk. And uh, I saw you mentioned that this, your defining your discrete free collaboration has a nice property that it has eigenvalues like 2, 0, 0, 0, and uh, etc. right? Um, yeah, here. Yes, so... So... The Laplacian is defined like that, uh, which means that sort of if I move everything by two, then I get uh, one zero eigenvalue and three eigenvalues equal to two. Yeah, I was just curious, is this property true for the classical uh, cotangent Laplacian for uh, with, with area normalized probably? No, because, um, because for the Euclidean, well, no, because for the Euclidean Laplacian, I mean, you, um, you cannot, so if you want to speak about the spectrum of the Euclidean Laplacian, then you need to put some boundary uh, conditions, right? Or look at some compact manifold, some tools. So the spectrum, um, so on the sphere, you can speak about the spectrum because um, because it's a closed manifold. Yeah. And for the classical cotangent Laplacian, um, you have to specify what you mean by the spectrum. 
Okay, okay. And that's also actually why this um, Lichtenrovich said oh, right, that, right, 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 that right, well, there's right, some right, positive right, coefficients. Right, right, it's not valid. I see, I see. And, okay, uh, Max, okay. yes, you have a question. Go ahead, Max. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so first of all, um, what, one question to what you just said. I mean, of course, we be weighed by area, right? For, for this, for the Euclidean Laplace, you know, to speak about the spectrum. If you just look at the cotine matrix, the spectrum would, you know, kind of converge to the, to something um, meaningless because it's an operator from H1 to H minus one. So, I mean, you want the spectrum to be have a setting and as an operator from L2 to L2, right? Yes. So you cannot just talk about the cotan matrix. You have to uh, look at the, at the area we're waiting somehow. So it's, it's not clear that you're too far away, at least not to me immediately, um, that the spectrum is completely off. I, I don't think that's necessarily true. But that was not really my question. The question was, going back to this Lichnorovich, I mean, the, the first eigenvalue um, always has a very geometric meaning, right? It's like the, if you want the, the best Poincaré constant, um, right, in, in terms of PDEs. I mean, how, how can you bound uh, the L2 error in terms of the, of the, of the L2 error of the, of the gradient? So um, if you want to discretize that, I mean, I guess if you would then stick in an appropriate, diff what I'm trying to say is you can, I guess, design a notion of discrete Ritchie curvature such that this is, 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 is true immediately. So my question is for which notion of Ritchie curvature do you think this is a good, this is an interesting question. We don't know what a discrete Ritchie curvature is necessarily, right? So what I'm trying to say is since lambda one has such a clear geometric meaning, um, we could perhaps design a discrete notion of Ritchie curvature but that just, this just becomes true by definition kind of, right? which then is, is probably not what you want. You probably want this to be a deep result. So, so what, which notion of Ritchie curvature do you, do you envision for this discrete result of Lichten Rothschild? That's my question. So if you take n equal to two, so these are just surfaces. Uh, you want the, the usual Gauss In my, case, in yeah, my okay. case, these are surfaces glued from the spherical triangles. Uh, then uh, the curvature big equal n minus one times g. This means for me, um, Actually, just that the the uh, curvatures at the thing at the cone points are positive, so angles at the cone points are smaller than two pi. And um, in fact, for the um, high dimensional manifolds, um, if one import well, so this condition from the Chigger theorem. Um, so if you take an n-dimensional polyhedral manifold, uh, then you have cone angles around spaces of co-dimension, co-dimension two. Um, and if all, if all of them are smaller than two pi, then this seems to be a very, very strong condition. So it's, um, uh, so people see it as a discrete analog of positive definite uh, curvature operator, and that's uh, stronger than the, than the positive Lichy curvature. So, um, so my conjecture would be that, well, I don't want to, to say this conjecture because the triangulations um, can play a big role. So, I think that if on the spherical, um, for the spherical polyhedral complex, one imposes the condition that first, all the singular curvatures are positive, and second, that angulation is good enough, which I don't know what means, uh, then uh, this um, spectral gap uh, holds. But so that is not a problem with, I think, with the uh, definition of the, of the singular curvature. The problem is of finding a good triangulation that can be difficult. Okay. Thank you, Ivan. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? Uh, okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again for an excellent talk. And, uh, and this concludes the morning session.